Just a few more moments. Um, we should be all set. Yes, a few more moments. Okay, um, great. Yes, I see people are here. Find a seat where you can. Uh, please turn off your cell phones. Um, good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you uh, for joining us tonight and welcome to the New York Studio School's virtual evening lecture series. Um, tonight is my great pleasure to be introducing Lucy Whelan and her presentation, Pierre Bernard Beyond Vision, Indeterminacy and Process. Um, I would like to thank Lucy for joining us from Cambridge. Um, so it's a bit later for her. And, uh, and I would like to thank all of you out in the audience um, for taking the time tonight. Um, and I would also like to just quickly recognize that the New York Studio School Evening Lecture Series is generously supported by an award from the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, as well as the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, the Robert Lehman Foundation, and many individual contributors. Um, if at any time during tonight's talk or afterwards, uh, you would like to make a contribution to the New York Studio School, please visit our website and, uh, and go to the donate page. And uh, we're eternally grateful. It helps bring this programming, um, it keeps this programming free and available to everybody. Um, I will introduce uh, Lucy in just one moment, but I do wanna, I'm sure we're all familiar, but I do wanna direct your attention to the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Uh, feel free to enter a question at any time during the talk, and then we'll leave time at the end um, to properly take questions. Um, with that, uh, Lucy Whelan is an art historian and research fellow at Downing College, University of Cambridge. Her research takes critical approaches to modern art in Europe with a particular focus on France. Uh, her first book, Pierre Bonnard, Beyond Vision, is forthcoming with Yale University Press um, this spring, 2022. Um, and uh, I believe the, it's, uh, the exact date is May 24th. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, and it presents a revised understanding of Pierre Bernard's practice as a painter, draftsman, and photographer. Uh, this project is the result of almost a decade of research and writing, including her PhD at the University of Oxford and a postdoctoral fellowship held at the Humboldt University in Berlin. Um, so uh, please join me now in a virtual welcome for Lucy Whelan. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, and it's really great to be here. And uh, thank you again so much for uh, inviting me. Um, yeah, so the um, that description of my book, um, which explains that I do bring together Bonnard's photographs and his drawings and his paintings is true. And actually that's what I, something I want to do today. I, though it most, the book mostly photo, uh, focuses on, on his paintings, but um, actually today it will be all, it really will be all three. Um, and uh, so I'll start uh, sharing my screen, which I'll attempt to do. Um, but I, I also wanted to say um, that it's it's a particular delight really to um, oh I shared the wrong screen mm, hang on share screen desktop two there we go yeah oh, is that screen sharing maybe Sam can you tell me is that right. Can you go to the full screen? We can see your screen. It's just you can see the screen. I just don't know why it's there. Is the, can you see the slides now? Yeah, it's it's full screen now. Great. I don't know why it wasn't doing that even though I clicked on it. So yeah, I wanted to say um, that I'm I am particularly excited to speak to the studio school audience um, because and we were talking about this before that I think Bonna is an is an artist artist and often artists understand him sometimes I think better than our historians. Uh, and um, as Sam said, my, my book is coming out in May, but of the existing studies already published of Bonner, the one I'm closest to is actually a book by Timothy Hyman, 
um, and his book is in the Thames and Hudson World of Art series. So, but it's it's actually a really serious little book, and it's no coincidence that that Tim Hyman is an artist himself. Um, but back back to my book, I suppose. First of all, I should explain where it's coming from. So, it's the result of a a, a lot of time um, dedicated to researching and writing on Bonan. During a PhD, you're fortunate to be able to sit for hours in front of a lot of his work, a, a lot of uh, artworks. I've sat. For a long time and and uh and traveled through the us as well um and i've also been able to stare at every page of the little diaries he carried with him everywhere they're about this big and leather bound and very tatty and they're lovely um and scour newspapers for interviews with him that have been overlooked all the stuff you have time to do when you're a phd student and then a postdoc and uh, I think it's for that reason that the result is, I hope, a different interpretation of him from the one that has effectively been da handed down through um, often um, in many aspects different uh, that has been from the one that has been handed down through scholarship and um, including exhibition catalogues and developed up until now. Um, but of all the comments and jottings that Bonnar wrote in his notebooks books or that I've found um, kind of given some new life to uh, from newspapers, my favourite is definitely something which the artist reportedly told the young painter Jocelyne Seguin in 1945. And that's that, I quote, the painting will not exist if the viewer does not do half the work. And it's a comment that absolutely makes sense in relation to his complex layered paintings with half hidden forms that really take time and effort to look at. Uh, it's a comment I can really believe that he said. So again, I, another reason why I'm excited to be speaking to an audience uh, this evening who I know is interested in doing some of that work of looking. So, I'd like to begin by explaining the title of my book, and this is the cover on, on the screen at the moment. It's called Bonnard Beyond Vision, but, and it's important to say, he was absolute, Bonnard was fascinated by vision, by natural human vision. And we can see this so clearly in works that really, uh, and here is another one, that really seat us at the table. Um, this, like Le Déjeuner here, uh, from 1932. The table wraps around us, it comes out from underneath us, as if we're sat at the table having tea with Mart, his wife, who's who's painted here. This red object right under us um, kind of come again comes out. The, the objects to the left are fall very sharply in perspective that recedes very, very sort of sternly. There's a kind of sense that we could be could be sat there uh, and a, a sense of looking at vision. But I start my book with this painting already. So I'm gonna let, suggest we look at a different one, which is La Table from 1925. And here too, there is a similar sense of human, natural human vision and the shape of things, how the table tilts up, feels like we might be standing in the room. But what's also interesting that you notice when you're, you're nearer the canvas is moments like this one, where the painting seems to trace and be interested in how the way the viewer's eyes might even flow around the canvas. And I'm talking about these red dots that dot around the, the edge of the plate that almost guide, guide, they feel, well, to me, standing in front of this painting, it feels like your eyes are being kind of guided around the edge. Now, we also know that Bonnard was interested in how the world looked to human vision, because in 1927, his nephew, Charles Terras, uh, recounted him describing it. Quote, close objects rise up towards us, edges slide away. These trailing edges are sometimes linear, as for distant things, sometimes curved, as for the foreground. The vision of distant things is flat. It's the foreground that gives us our concept of the world as seen through human eyes. Now, there are a lot of things reportedly said by Bonnard, quotes that have been recycled that I would and do dispute that he, he said, um, such as the painting is a stopping of time. Um, uh, I mean, that, that, I can, that is in the book and I can talk about it later in the Q&A. But we really know that this quote was okay, um, that because Bonnard approved of this biography by his nephew and recommended it to, to interviews who wanted to get to know him better. Um, but, and here is one of the really cool, this is really one of the core claims of, of, um, that I make about Bonnard. Although he was interested in vision, and this is something, and his interest in vision is something that is often emphasized, he was more fascinated by its errors 
by the moment when vision becomes fallible, such that it takes a long time to notice that next to Mart is a dog in this painting. Moments when plates and baskets seem to slide off tables or when objects become ambiguous. It's often, it has been suggested, I think, by somebody that this uh, shadowy form under the table here is perhaps uh, another dog, Bonas. I don't know, uh, but there's something shadowy going on under the table. Incidentally, I think this painting is actually also deeply uncanny um, with this open door, but the uncanny in Bono is something I'd love to write about, and it's not in my book, uh, sadly. Um, but I digress. Um, objects become ambiguous. Their, their outlines and their colours seem impossible to pick apart from other objects with any real level of precision. Shadows cast by objects can seem more dense and more substantial than the objects themselves. How else, how else does vision seem to be in error? It's not even possible, it's possible sometimes not even to notice, at least not for a long period of time, where shades of white that seem white are in fact blobbed with yellow, suggesting tungsten, that light of, a, of, the, of the evening. What's more in Bonnard, the already strange realities of seeing are inseparable from questions about how artists supposedly translate, translate vision into paint. His brushwork never adds up to a coherent kind of style. Instead, it varies across the canvas. Just look, for example, at this bottle with its flat, thick lines, broken, thin ones, generally a diverse streaks, jumble of streaks and daubs of different kinds. Um, Bonnard's is a kind of painting that I think doesn't ever let us um, quite uh, put style to one side and doesn't ever quite let us know which of its strange densities and ambiguities or unexpected streaks can just be put down to style and which ones are to the potential strangeness of the visible world and to the errors and fallibilities of vision. And so, yes, Bonnard was fascinated by vision. But moreover, in his 20th century work anyway, he was intent on troubling vision and its relationship to representation. He was intent, I think, on exploring through visual means the fact that we can never simply paint or draw what we see or paint vision or transcribe it in any kind of straightforward way. Now, the Impressionists, didn't who are of the generation before him but he's very interested in their work didn't simply transcribe vision onto canvas their painting is more complicated than that but as i say bonas generation came along after them and uh and during that formative decade for for bonas and the, the nabi artists of, of which he was part uh, of that group in the 1890s, it was a criticism leveled against the Impressionists by that generation that they were naive, that the Impressionists were naive in trying to paint their sensations, that they were kind, they had been kind of naively empirical. So Bonnard, as I said, he had huge admiration for Monet in particular and for Renoir. He was fascinated by their work. I mean, in 19, around 1912, he, he pretty much moves to Juvenny. Um, so that he can live just down the road from Monet. It's just a short drive in, in the car that he had at the time. Um, uh, so, and, and he wrote about Renoir, um, but we shouldn't overlook the fact that he also accused the Impressionists of a base and thoughtless realism. He said that's from a, a quote from 1938. We also shouldn't overlook the fact, and, and it has been overlooked, that Bonnard was a fan of Cubism. Speaking again in 1938, he said that Cubism for him had been thrilling and transformative. He said, and I quote, it put into question the problems of knowledge. It stripped me bare. It gave me greater freedom. So yes, Bonnard was intent on troubling the assumption that the artist's direct experience of the world can ever be transcribed onto canvas. And this is broadly what the title of my book, Bonnard Beyond Vision, refers to. Not a lack of interest in vision, but an interest in both in vision and in, in if you like, going beyond it. Now, I think this is actually quite visible in Bonnard's paintings, as I've already shown with La Table and, and Le Déjeuner. But I'm aware, uh, 
that there may be people listening uh, to whom this almost seems quite obvious. And that's a good thing, actually. If I'm saying something we, that isn't kind of obvious uh, to, to tonight's audience in the paintings, then um, then I'm probably barking up the wrong tree. So I, I, I almost hope that, that perhaps what I've said might so far might almost seem obvious. But in that case, it may then come as a surprise that, um, especially to anyone who is more familiar with Bonnard's works than the ins and outs of the scholarship on Bonnard, that many, if not most, art, I think most art historians who have written on Bonnard might disagree with me or who have, or have at least taken a different emphasis. Many art historians have actually moved from Bonnard's interest in vision to the fairly literal idea and to and his interest in the shape of natural human vision to the idea that he is, was painting his own natural vision. Um, that he was, or that he was perhaps drawing attention to how our eyes work, to peripheral vision, for example, um, to the way the eyes move across the canvas. There have been attempts, for example, to go round his house, but by people I, I should say I uh, greatly respect and really like their work, but there have been attempts to go around his house taking photographs to try and mock up the very wide angles of his, wide angle views of his paintings um, to show that this is akin to natural vision. And there's something in that, but it's, it's, I, and it goes along with what other art historians have done, which is, um, or how other art historians have seen him, which is in a way to call his studio a kind of laboratory for, for analyzing vision. Now, this mixes in with the fact that Bonnard also famously painted from memory. So then you have this idea that Bonnard was painting vision that comes with the extra caveat that what he's painting is a memory of what he saw. And so it's said that he paints these moments of, of daily life or memories of moments. And I think this is interesting because it implies that the mind of the artist can work as if he has an inner camera, like he can hold an image in his mind perfectly and then paint from it. Um, but this evening, I hope to convince you, if you aren't already convinced, that Bonnard's aim couldn't be been any further from this idea of the artist as a kind of camera eye. And if anything, I think his work through painterly, through means, through artistic means, really counters the idea that the artist can, transcri can transcribe from an image in the mind onto paper or canvas in this kind of direct way. First though, I want to rewind just a little bit in time in Bonnard's career, because uh, Bonnard's attempts to think through these kinds of questions about vision start early in his career as a Nabi artist during the 1890s. So this is Antimite or Intimacy from 1891. Now I won't go into it at length here, but I think um, it's, it's quite telling because it's a quite sincere attempt, I think, to try and paint vision as it is seen out of our own eyes. Um, you see the hand at the bottom of the canvas with holding a pipe. You see from the very bottom of the frame um, uh, or of the yellow edge that frames the that frames the image, um, the picture, uh, uh, um, smoke curling up as if it's coming from the artist's mouth beneath the picture frame, and it's interesting because as an attempt to paint vision, this is in some ways a failed attempt. Partly because ultimately the idea of painting what you see is just simply at odds with the Nabi style, which is highly synthetic. So. Yes, I think how we can draw or render our own vision is something that Bonnard continues to think about on and off in the very early years of the 20th century. He's not alone in this. As I've mentioned, I think that part of the legacy of 19th century art that his generation was dealing with were questions about um, the naive empiricism, the potentially naive empiricism of painting one's own sensations. And he, he wasn't alone in painting, thinking about painting vision in a literal way and the problems with trying to do so. And we see this in, in uh, what I think of as a pair of drawings in that they were at least done in the same year, 1904, by Matisse on the left and Bonnard on the right, uh, for two very different purposes, no doubt. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that they, they colluded in any way. Um, but nonetheless, remarkable parallel experiments painting a drawing of what they see that includes their own legs. On the right, Bonnard's sketch, I think the leg in front of him is at a much more awkward angle. It's almost not the artist's own in that it's almost not quite attached to the viewpoint that is seeing. 
Matisse's picture here is actually, though, almost the more awkward of the two because he's tried to get the pencil, the hand, the leg in the right place. And the result is something that's not actually quite natural. It's a kind of transparent attempt at naturalizing something that is ultimately synthetic, the process of making pictures. Um, and so unsurprisingly, this is not a theme that Matisse pursues. Yet Bonnard's own interest in first person vision and also in its awkwardness, its inherent awkwardness returns, uh, particularly it returns two decades later um, when we see the, the return of this slightly detached leg in, um, in Le Grand Nubleu from 1924. Again, there is a slight detachment from the body that would attach the uh, from to the eyes that would see this point of view in this painting. So again, the first person point of view has a kind of awkward, unpin downableness. If anything, although this might seem at first glance like, oh, here's the artist's leg, we're supposed to be imagining that we're just in the artist's body, seeing this view. Actually, if anything, what this painting seems to play with is the idea that. Uh, transcribing vision directly, there's nothing direct. You can kind of purport to do it, but there's actually nothing direct about it. That this too is a painting, it's lines, it's brushstrokes on a canvas. It's still a work of art, ultimately. Um, if anything, whereas artists like, like Kaibot, um, Gustave Kaibot, impressionist artist whose work fascinated Bonnard, had tried to convince the viewer that the artist can elegantly transfer the world seen to the world represented. Um, Bonnard, by contrast, Bonnard's ungainly and, and kind of hilarious naked leg, placed slightly too far to the left, seems to counter that idea uh, that we find in Kaiba. So forgive me for working through these ideas quite quickly. Um, the idea of, of of seeing from outside of the body is something I talk about at much more length in the book. But uh, there's another way in which Bonnard, there are other ways in which Bonnard's work engages with and ultimately resists the idea of painting an image of the world as seen and fixed in the mind's eye. And that is through highly indeterminate processes of making. Processes that far from implicitly treating the artist like a camera have no fixed endpoint. And that's what I want to look at now um, for the, and for the rest of this talk partly because it takes us away from the interiors and, and the bather nudes for which Bonnard is more famous and to these three slightly less familiar, at least in, at least less, less talked about um, in scholar, scholarly writing on, or, or in, in general in writing um, on, on Bonnard, to, to uh, three less familiar in that sense, areas of his work that I think still shed light on the whole. And that's to his landscape paintings, his drawings, and, and finally to his photographic practice. practice. So um, indeterminacy and process um, across these three media. And, and first is his practice of drawing. Um, so here's a drawing with no date, but it's probably from the 20s or 30s. Um, and it seems to be a landscape with different sections of a scene. I, you can hardly tell it's a landscape, but I think there are probably many people who can um, in this audience and, uh, or who would agree with me, I should say. Um, I probably don't have time to dwell on, on the different components of it, but, um, but something I probably don't need to persuade anyone of is that it's very processed based drawing in a sense, one rather than one that gropes for, um, that kind of tries to eyeball the forms or grope for their form in order to get it accurate, you know, as you might expect with lots of little tiny marks, actually there's no groping for accuracy here of, of iconic representation. There's just a letting the lines flow as if releasing an inner pressure from um, a kind of sensual pleasure that seems to be felt almost in the whole hand, the whole arm that we can almost imagine looking at it. There's a lovely line in Bonnard's diaries. It is necessary sometimes to draw with the wrist, he writes. Um, curiously, he writes a name next to that, which is Valotong. Felix, Felix Valaton, uh, a Nabi friend of his, but I think that might be a coincidence. He probably met him on the same day because there's a remark in his diaries, um, because I, I don't think I would particularly associate that with Valaton. Um, but anyway, it's a curiosity there. Um, uh, but this is true, even this kind of uh, drawing with the wrist is visible even when he's drawing with lighter lines. Here's a view seen through a window 
And, and Bonnard's friend, Georges Besson, recalled that Bonnard's preferred drawing tool was a tiny pencil stub and almost nothing of a pencil, so small that I suppose you have to grip it so much that it becomes part of your hand. You can't handle it deftly. There's no length to it, right? It's just the stub. So the lines in his work seem to, in his drawings, seem to emerge from a kind of momentum. Um, they're also uh, frequently made on, on any old scrap, and I'm sure that's true of, of many artists um, but actually to an extent that Pete that his friends commented upon it um, George Besson I think it was also said that he was so kind of well known for drawing on any tiny scrap he could get his whole hand on he would draw with his finger dipped in a little bit of coffee and cigarette ash on a napkin uh, I mostly love that anecdote for the coffee and the cigarette ash just quite evocative um, and uh, they f his, his drawings feel their way across the paper the lines seem to emerge from a kind of momentum. Above all, his drawings are drawings are drawing as uh, what Jean-Luc Nancy in his little book on drawing writes about as a f infinite, inconclusive pleasure. Above all, it's it's drawing uh, as a kind of unfolding or drawing out something that has not been envisioned in advance. Now, incidentally, uh, Bonnard's drawing is another place where artists have looked at Bonnard. There's a 1994 essay by the late British painter, Saji Mann, which I think is wonderful. Um, but they're still, um, still not looked at uh, that much, although uh, Sam was telling me that actually perhaps that's not true in um, uh, studio school circles. Um, but nonetheless, the French photo agency RMN has a lot of them to view online. Uh, and so if you enjoy looking at Bonnard's drawings, I really, really recommend looking at that. Um, so, uh, so what's important to note, something that's important to note about Bonnard's drawings is that they were also often memory aids. It's not so clear in this one, but, um, but it becomes clearer in, oh, there's another one. Um, but it becomes clear in something like this, where where the different kinds of pencil marks themselves could could seem to almost function like reminders for where to put different kind of colors in strata. It seems to function as a as a as a memo as much as um, as much as any as a drawing in itself. And they, according to um, according to well uh, certain sources, they often contain notes for colors that he would apply later. I haven't seen any with notes on, um, and so I can only assume he destroyed them, which is quite interesting. Um, uh, but as I've said, there's this received idea that Bonnard painted from memory that I think is often misunderstood and often taken too literally. Um, yes, memory is important in his work, uh, but it is absolutely wrapped up with this process of drawing which I believe partly creates or even is this memory. Because we have to reconcile the fact that um, there's a very obvious visual evidence of the fact that he was drawing and feeling his way through drawing with the idea that he explained that uh, he was interested in the first impression, the thing that just strikes him in front of the motif. Um, and but I think that we have to think about this first idea or this first impression as something other than this perfect image in his mind that he holds on to, because we know that his drawings were actually what lay the foundation for his paintings. And when he was asked uh, by a journalist, Angèle Lamotte, um, in, in the 1930s, if he had a good memory, he replied, and I quote, not at all, and, and explained, and that was a moment when he explained and showed her these, these drawings he made that were covered in notes. Um, so, uh, so that's one way in which, um, in which I hope uh, to kind of persuade or rethink about this idea that of, of painting from vision um, by looking at his drawings. But as for Bonnard's paintings, um, it's yes, his interiors have these fascinate have fascinating ambiguities um, that remain unresolved even with repeated looking. But it's his landscapes that I think are particularly interesting in their irresolvability and in the endless looking that they invite. Um, and I kind of call them dissolved uh, landscapes uh, increasingly. And I think or this dissolved quality, what I call a dissolved quality, we find increasingly from the 1920s. So, so here is de Santo Canet from 1943, which is just four years before Bonnard's death in 1947. Le Canet is the town that Bonnard um, kind of lived in or at least owned a villa in from 1927. He actually traveled a lot. He's called a hermit. We think of Bonnard as 
um, as hiding away once he moved down to Lacanne, but his diaries show that this is not true. Um, he, he drove all around France um, a lot and until pretty much uh, until pretty much the, the onset of the Second World War. Um, and uh, here, we, here we are looking in, or here's this painting looking down into the valley towards Cannes, um, kind of glittering houses and possibly, sun, possibly maybe during sunset, uh, or evocative of the sunset anyway. And of course it was painted during the occupation in France, but there's no sign of that, that here. Now the overlap and the, the, the overlapping colours um, are interesting here because the same colours appear all over the canvas, peeking in between the layers. Um, you see them repeat again and again. And um, I think this is a good example of how his paintings and especially his landscapes are brimful of what Paul Klee called a painting's multidimensionality, the layering, overlapping and overwriting of a painting itself. So richly orchestrated that with every return to an area of the canvas, the viewer can find something new, some new way of overlapping, some other color that seems to stand out. And I think this sense of infinity was hugely important to Bonnard in, from the 1920s onwards, especially in the 1930s and 40s. He wrote in his diary comments like, nature is infinite, the artwork is finite, limited, um, that, that he wrote in, in 1936. And just a few years after that, he wrote to Matisse, uh, his, his by this time friend, Henri Matisse, but as for vision, I see things differently every day. The sky objects, all changes continually. One can drown in it, but that's what brings life. He also, Bonnard also in these years spoke to an interviewer of choosing to paint subjects like the sea and the sky precisely because they would change before he could get them down onto canvas. And in general, Bonnard's landscapes, I think, attempt to find a form or a manner of painting that would reflect some of this sheer infinite variety of this continuous renewal and endless process that he found in nature. Yes, the canvas is finite and nature is infinite, but you can find a way, or at least I think he's looking for a way to formally allude to that infinitude of life. His works are made, and particularly his landscapes are made from a diverse array of marks, of streaks, of scribbles, but mostly of, of touches or daubs, some blended and mottled, some not. And, and they're piled up in his lands, and this is where his land, this is particularly true of his landscapes, in a slightly chaotic way, uh, overlapping and, and piled, he often. The, the, the surface of Bonnard's canvases remains really thin because he, he wiped the paint away with a rag and continually kind of painted and then wiped and painted and then wiped. So although it's very overlaid, the, the surface remains quite thin, although I'm actually sure I don't need to tell you that. Um, so we, we, we know that Bonnard worked on several canvases at once, various from various people who, who watched him work. Um, I'm coming back here to this idea of colors returning again and again in the same canvas. We know he returned and returned to paintings that he'd made months, even years earlier. Now there are lots of anecdotes about Bonnard that possibly aren't true, but there's one that I think is from what I can tell. And that's that he was found um, by the security guard of the Musée d'Art Moderne in Paris, um, um, the, the museum um, there, touching up his paintings as they hung on the wall and security apprehended him and um, and they had this old man crying saying no no I'm the great paint who'd been like fiddling with the paintings in the museum and crying and saying no no I'm I am the great painter I am Bonnard and they're like really and uh, he said please call my friend Henri Cartier-Bresson he'll tell you it's me and and anyway and so that that's how they let him out. Um, but anyway, so yes, as much as I'm quite skeptical about anecdotes, this one does seem to appear in a couple of places. Um, so we know he would return to paintings over a really long period of time. We also know that he loaded his brush with color and then walked around seeking a place for that brush stroke in a canvas. So not looking at the canvas and saying, oh, that needs this color there, but actually just walking around going, where can I, where can I add this kind of adding another mark? At least that's according to people who watched him work. But I think looking at his surfaces, um, surfaces, and, and here's another painting um, called Le, Le Jardin, Le Jardin, The Garden of the Artist. Uh, I think looking at his surfaces, this makes sense. And um, 
and his Le Jardin, 1936, which um, I think really shows um, the varied language of his painting, the huge variation in um, textures of drawing uh, as a way of, and coming back to that idea of the sketch actually, of preserving the original impression, but which is not actually to do with memory, but as much to do with the drawing itself that he made originally. Um, but again, my main point, uh, but in talking about his landscapes, is that Bonnard is not just painting, not painting a vision held in the mind, but that painting for him is a process of a kind of un continually unfolding duration. Uh, and I might mention that in this, there is also the thinking of Henri Bergson, the philosopher that I'm quite certain Bonnard uh, read, and also Greek thought that he chose to study uh, during his last years at school and continue to read through his life. There's a third way, um, and I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the time, but uh, there's a third way that we find this kind of sense of process too, also in Bonnard's photography. So his photography is mostly from a slightly earlier period in his career, from 1898 to about 1905 is the, is the main period, uh, main time that he um, takes most of his photographs. It's generally dismissed as amateur. And there are a couple of books on his photographs, but they've never really been looked at as part of his artistic project before. But I believe that they are absolutely part of his artistic project. And his photography does seem amateur in a sense. I'm not denying that. They're generally, his photographs are generally of family and friends and of everyday life. And like this one, they're entirely unposed. But image making is always a choice. And actually his choice for an aesthetic of, of spontaneity is one that we shouldn't forget is entirely a piece with his general aesthetic of indeterminacy and spontaneity. Later in life, even when his paintings were well known, he'd insist to journalists that he didn't know how to paint and he talked about aiming to forget all that he knew. So with this interest in naivety, um, and uh, in keeping with ideas of his time, he saw this kind of spontaneity as the ultimate kind of artistic authenticity. Um, and, it, and this relates again to, to my uh, point about indeterminacy and process. Um, and one particularly uh, interesting uh, thing about Bonnard's photography is how he kept his photographs. So he never enlarged any individual photograph to more than six centimeters in width. Instead, he treated them a lot like film reel, processing the negatives into uncut printed photographs into strips, in strips of two or more images, and they were post pasted like this into uh, a notebook in series. And very often he took photographs in series, like these of um, his brother-in-law, Claude Terrasse, wrestling with a friend in, in a garden. And there's a sense of a cinematic. They, they remind me of, um, and they remind us, I'm sure, of, of film strips made by Edward Muybridge that were photographic studies of motion. But um, they were photographic studies of motion, but these are filled with much more contingency than that. Each photograph has a relationship to time that is really open. They're not temporally stable on their own because each one is part of what is an ongoing event. Even just going back to this previous image, here too, Bonnard's taking a photograph at a moment that risks the unexpected, where the event hasn't resolved, that opens the question of what might happen next. Taking a photograph like this is not actually as simple as it seems. Um, and, you know, it's easy to, I think, um, get into a kind of rhythm or wait for a moment of order to present itself. But in musical terms, this is the equivalent of, of not going on the beat, but playing off the beat. Um, it's, it's actually pressing the shutter at a moment when there's something present to the camera, but when the event that's unfolding hasn't entirely resolved is, is a choice and it's quite an interesting choice. And it's interesting that this coincides with, uh, and particularly Bonas uh, cinematic kind of um, interesting contingency coincides with the period during which the output um, of filmmakers like Georges Méliès and uh, uh, and Auguste and Louis Lumiere were also making little films of odd moments in everyday life, like a baby eating, for example. And these are films that, well, Bonnard's bon uh, photographs aren't, aren't films. They share this something of the indeterminacy and temporal flow of the very, very early films. Um, 
so yeah, there's more I can say there, but I think, but so talking of temporal flow, Bonnar also experimented with rewinding the reel. I just want to mention this very briefly. I didn't kind of get a chance to in my book um, uh, and taking photographs on top of others. So it's true that photographs like this one may have been an accident with the Kodak handheld camera that was then so new, but even if they were accidents, he printed them out, he kept them. Um, and I, I, I'm sure you can see the, the two figures printed on top of one another here. Again, this seems to treat photographic time quite differently from the classic idea of the photograph as a single preserved moment. Instead, looking at this, we might again think of something like an indeterminate, unspecific passage of time passing between two separate moments that have been cast onto the same piece of film. It's not about seizing the world with one's camera, but, but something spanning, something more indeterminate. Uh, so Bonnard is often called a belated impressionist, but actually I think this is um, quite wrong. He was enthralled to the impressionists, but he was of a markedly different generation. Um, the impressionists were of a time that was the height of 19th century positivism, a way of thinking that tried to divide up experience and turn it into the discrete objects of scientific study. And I'm not saying that they were as simple as that, but that is certain. But by the 1890s, there was a strong backlash in, in general against positivism. And Bonnard is of that generation, of that backlash against positivism, of a generation who Berg, for whom Henri Bergson was a key figure um, in that movement. And he and Bergson advocates a philosophy of, of going outside and beyond the self, of entering into the world, and argues for time and nature as a continuous, indivisible flow, completely opposite to, to the um, positivist. Uh, late 19th century, prior, prior to the 1890s. Um, so, uh, and, uh, and, and I should say that this criticism of Impressionism was definitely in Bonnard's circles um, with the likes of uh, Felix Fénéon uh, and others. So, so in Bonnard, um, we, find, we find a project developed especially from the 1920s onwards that rejects the basis for representation in simply subjective vision. The idea that subjective vision can be kind of taken, peeled off from its membrane, like a membrane placed on canvas. His instead is a project of going beyond vision, adopting a viewpoint on the world that no longer purports to be, to belong to an all seeing master of all, um, of the master of, of everything it surveys, but instead is more interested in finding a kind of visual relationship to the world that is located beyond the self. Um, I'll come back to that. I don't think I explained it very well just then, but I want to end um, by re reflecting um, that this idea of the artist as no longer trying to assert a kind of mastery over the visible world, a kind of capturing of the visible world, this idea that I find in Bonnard. I want to reflect about how this briefly, um, how this pertains to the way that we might think about modernism as a whole. Um, because the result of looking at Bonnard this way for me has, al has also been to consider more broad stepping back a little bit, uh, a different path or a different kind path for modernism, a different kind of modernism, one that doesn't endeavour to capture or transform the world, but rather explores what it might mean to lose oneself in it. I'm talking about a strand within modernism of artists whose work oscillate fluidly between figuration and abstraction, that embrace the indeterminacies and ambiguities of process and invite a slower form of looking. It's a strand that reaches from or back to Monet's oceanic nymphia, in which you can lose all sense of what is up and what is down and dissolve yourself completely into their boundlessness. And these are works, incidentally, which Bonnard definitely, uh, the, the, the water lilies, which Bonnard definitely saw when he was visiting Giovanni in the 1910s. And in the other direction, uh, I think this this old kind of way of thinking about modern, this kind of modernism reaches forward to certain abstract expressionist and color field painters like Mary Abbott, Sam Francis, Helen Frank and Peya, and Joan Mitchell. And these works, of course, he didn't see, although many of the post, this post-war generation would have seen the major retrospective of Bonnard's work in the year after his death, 1948, at MoMA. Um, so 
And so whereas more dominant models of modernist painting in the 20th century have been premised upon flatness, temporal immediacy, pure opticality, th this comes from ground, that way of looking at modernism comes from grounding painting in the empirical conditions of vision. But Monet, Bonnard, Frank and Taylor Mitchell, these artists did not treat time, space or vision or the self in quite this way. And they certainly, although I do not purport to be an expert on all, all of these artists, of course, but they certainly didn't see vision as a pure entity that is separable from memory or imagination. And I think this is a positive thing. Um, modernism in its paradigmatic form has long been thought of as centered upon a certain creative masculine individualism, a kind of mastery of the visible. Um, and, uh, and instead in Bonnard, we find this displaced viewpoint, a kind of passivity to the endlessly piled up variable in um, piled up strokes, uh, brush strokes, an endlessly variable indeterminate style of painting. Um, and I think there's a strongly gendered aspect to this. I write in one of my one of the chapters of my book um, is is kind of focused on on his relationship in his paintings to his wife and model Mart. Um, I, I call her Mart, uh, aware of the problems of calling women by their first names, but uh, she had a complicated relationship to her surname, so I call her Mart. Um, and uh, and she appears here on the, on the cover of the book. Um, in the painting dining room on the uh, overlooking the garden, um, which is in New York, I think. Um, and uh, because I think she actually becomes a figure within his work that enables him to go beyond his own experience by instead centering her experience. Uh, she, he kind of follows her around the house. And, things. and I don't have time to dwell on this now, but um, I want to, <laughs> to kind of add that there is a gender, a very literally gendered aspect um, to to Bonnard's going, project of going beyond vision. Um, but it also, as I've explained, extends beyond his works and um, representation of, sorry, beyond his representation of the figure of Mart. And, um, uh, and in some ways beyond what I've managed to write about in this book. Um, but I only allude very much at the end of the book, I should say, to, to suggesting a parallel track within modernism. But nonetheless, I hope that by offering a version of Bonnard that, that I offer, I, I show a side to modern art that differs from the paradigm of, of a dominating masculine individualist vision. Uh, writing a feminist art history, uh, Bonnard isn't, you know, I wouldn't call it that. It's not something I set out to do. But nonetheless, um, I hope to draw attention to an art that invites us, the viewer, to lose ourselves in it to see it as a process as much of a product as much as a product and a bubble to look slowly. Thank you. Um, I can see there are already some questions, so I'll stop sharing my screen. I'll stop there. Um, thanks very, very much for listening. Um, Thank you, Lucy. Um, um, yeah, I'm sure we'll have some questions coming in. I, I do see a few already. Um, yeah. I'm wondering, I'll, I'll just sort of steal the first question. If you could speak yeah. to, there's been a lot of speculation on Mart's and Bonar's um, relationship. I wonder if you could just mm. speak to their intimacy or lack thereof in, in any kind of documented sense, if you, if mm. you, yeah. that you know of. Intimacy or lack thereof, that's an interesting way of putting it. Um, so uh, one, one very um, empirical point on that is that she, so they met in 1893 um, and um, she dies in 1942. So they're often talked about as this kind of um, lifelong pair, inseparable, she's core to his work. And I think, I think she is actually, but I found some documents um, or actually I, I didn't find, I, I was, helped very kindly. Archivists are wonderful. Um, and not just archivists, but also a local, a local researcher um, found um, uh, um, a certificate that was a uh, Mart's brother's death certificate uh, in the 1890s. I can't remember exactly when, 1890s. 1899, 1899. Anyway, she signs her name as Mart Renard suggesting that she was actually married briefly to a Mr. Renner, Renner. Um, 
And it's actually really interesting. I, I compared this to the paintings and realized that she disappears for a period of time. So this whole narrative that they meet in 1893 and he paints her forevermore until her death in 1942 is not quite true. And so that's very interesting. But it's also interesting that when he stops painting, he stops painting her and he goes through, um, in general, he, he, I think his paintings are strongest when she's there. I also think it's very interesting. We shouldn't forget that she's often talked about as mentally a little bit unwell, but um, all of their friends, he painted these very, very intimate scenes that we love that are intimism in its um, most literal sense of, uh, of kind of daily everyday moments. Um, and she's very often naked and they are extremely vulnerable and um, maybe that's not quite the right word. Um, but anyway, but um, we talk about her as, as perhaps mentally unwell. I think it's quite interesting that he did that to her. There is also a kind of feminist, sorry, maybe I'm suddenly being all stridently feminist. It is quite interesting to see that their friends, she was so constantly his muse. There's this way in which he follows her around the house. She's constantly in his work, whether it's moving through doorways or in the bath or whatever. And um, there, there's an intimacy that I think we shouldn't assume had this kind of positive, lovely lightness. I think there's a dark side to that intimacy, but it's very, very hard to get close to understanding more about what it was like. He traveled an awful lot. And I think sometimes she, a lot of the time she didn't go with him. I think he spent vast periods of time in Paris, um, probably alone. It's, um, sorry, I, I don't think I've managed to answer that very directly. I think I'm rather thinking it through. Uh, I should probably just stop waffling on that one because I could waffle well, for a while. What you're saying is very interesting. So um, I'll, uh, but I'll go to, uh, the questions that are coming in. Um, Thank you, though, for that uh, question. Let's see. Um, this is from Charlotte, and she's asking, lovely, she says, lovely talk. Thank you. Do you think Bernard's continued return to the domestic setting, like the breakfast table, bath, and garden, is about stretching out the temporal element you mentioned happens with this phot photography? or how you described him stretching out how the eye travels across the dish on the table. Mm. Yeah, I do think um, that's a really interesting question. Um, another interesting question. I, I do think that there's, that precisely the returning to the same or seemingly the same kinds of scenes is, is about stretching out time, but it's stretching it out in the way that it's the, um, uh, it's about the kind of return and cyclical and endless nature of time. He seems very interested, especially towards the end of his life in seasons. He writes about how the, um, the endless changing of nature, the fact that no, it's that kind of um, ancient Greek idea, you can never step in the same river twice. There's this endless process and endless change. He writes about, uh, when I say about the seasons, he writes about how there are so many little species of flower and how it's the, that come out and that the seasons are kind of what you get a, is, is partly a sense you get from his work that the seasons or the changing seasons are what keeps him going because there's always something new and there's always something different and then um, there's always a new little species of flower and then the seasons change again and the interesting thing about all the different interiors that he paints is that they're kind of the same but they're also kind of different and he we talk a lot about um, him being in Le Canet which is his the property he owned from 1927 and, and the one in Normandy but he also moves around the country a lot and he rents different villas in different places he goes to Arcachon in 1931 I think this is where this painting on the cover of my book is painted um, and he rents a villa there for uh, months at a time and um, I think he chooses villas they generally have a bathroom. They generally have a kind of dining room with a big window. They have some really similar elements to his other paintings. And I think he chooses, partly chooses villas or at least likes to stay and stays for longer in places where they're a lot like his other place at home, but different in other small ways. Um, and, uh, and so he's finding endless change in the familiar. And I, yeah, I think the question put it really beautifully that, that that is a kind of expanding and finding infinite varieties um, with it. A kind of expand, yeah, a kind of expanding of time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if there was more to that question, but perhaps, perhaps that was the core of it. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, this question is from uh, I think we're get, gonna get a lot of questions of Lucy so please you know. try and answer them quicker <laughs> no uh, 
This question is from Paula. Um, she's asking, um, when Bonard uh, started taking photographs, did his memory of what his vision, of what his vision change? Um, and did he paint from the images of his photos? Photos, they themselves are amazing. Mm, they are amazing. Uh, did he paint from the photographs? I'd hate to say no for definite, but I, there may be one or two cases. Ah, there are cases where he took photographs in order to paint them um, for his, um, he, he uh, did some beautiful illustra illustrations for Daphne and Chloe, for uh, Daphne and Chloe, um, uh, and he deliberately went out, the it seems that he deliberately went out the camera and marked and they took photographs naked of one another in the woods. And then he kind of uses them for the basis of his illustrations. And, and um, but that's kind of different, just of the spontaneous everyday seeming snap sort of snapshots. Um, he doesn't seem to have particularly used them to my, that I can think of for any paintings. Um, as for the memory question, I don't know. I, I, that's one of those things that has to remain unknown, I think. Mm. Did he take, did he use the photography throughout his life? Um. No, it seems to be most intense by a long way in this, in this period around, around the very turn of the century. And I don't really know of any really late, um, really late images. And it's interesting that he, in 1927 uh, is at all, around 1927, before 1927, that's when the quote is reported by his nephew in the biography, talks about photography as being a dry medium. And that the whole, I think, I think he sees that, and actually this is kind of it, he's kind of reacts against photography because ultimately photography, he plays with photography in quite a cinematic way that length that stretches time, but ultimately it's a snapshot. It takes a moment uh, and isolates it. And I think this is very anti that stretching of time, that kind of uh, stretching of time that he was interested in doing. And so um, I think actually he is trying to achieve something in painting that photography that is anti-photographic. So I think that's one of the reasons he gives it up. Um, okay, just trying to read through some of these questions. This is an interesting question from, from Linda. Um, she's asking, she says, in reference to your suggestions of his photography, mm -hmm. a passing moment, the little brown dog, Ubu, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, mm. is in reference to a Jerry play, Pierre yeah. Ubu, that is in many of his works, realism and influences in any way. Ubu follows his wife and her activities. Um, I guess that's kind of a suggestion and a comment. Mm. So how Ubu follows his wife? Yeah, oh, Ubu, in the paintings, Ubu is always mm. around his wife. Yeah, she, he, yeah, he is always around. Interestingly, I don't know that's Ubu. Um, do you know what's funny about Bon? Actually, Ubu, it's really funny. Bon and his animals. Um, he went to Hamburg in 1913, and he, he took his he took Ubu with him. I just find that ever so, ever so funny. Um, I mean, I shouldn't find it funny. I don't know why I do. Sorry, I mean, there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking an animal on a, um, on a trip. But I just love the idea of this this Frenchman wandering around, not wandering around Hamburg, not speaking a word of German with his sausage dog. Um, but uh, and also, when one Ubu died, he I think he renamed another one of his dogs Ubu. Um, and so I can never tell. And they also had a dog called Black. I think it's Black that's in the painting La Tab. Um, I, I must admit, I have not been, I've not been diligent in trying to work out which dog is in which picture. Um, uh, but yes, yeah, they they occur. And and Mart is always, um, Mart is always uh, often with them and and playing with them. They, but I I think they do um, they do do something interesting in in Bruno's work. I mean, he he often is painting and drawing animals. I think in general, and I don't have any uh, pictures in this slideshow of, um, uh, that exemplify this, but he really, I, he really almost identifies with what, um, I think actually it may be in the Dita Amory catalog is, I think it may be Dita, Dita sorry, Amory who, who puts this beautifully that he has a, a way of um, a feeling empathy for the innocence, innocence with a 
with a T on the end of this world, you know, kind of babies and children and dogs and cats. And I think there is, um, that's a very Bonardian thing. Um, it's kind of almost to do with, again, not trying to master the world, getting down on the level of, of people who see of things, little creatures, and I, I don't refer to Mark there, obviously, but um, that might see it differently. Um, there's a, I'm, I'm thinking of painting where you're kind of sat at the table, you're almost seated at the table within the painting, and there's children around it, and you feel like you're almost invited to see the world from the perspective of these children. I think he was fascinated. Um, in fact, uh, seeing from uh, the perspective of uh, other creatures, um, and uh, the, there are kind of comments that um, he used to try, I can't remember where this is from, but he used to try standing on one leg to paint on the wing, like almost like trying to see like a bird. And other times people have called his works taking a bee's eye view. And I think that there, well, I talk about this a bit in the book um, and can make it make more sense there when I'm not trying to dash the question. But um, I think he really does, is quite interested in seeing the world from no, almost non-human perspectives at times. So I think the animals actually play a, a philosophically interesting role as well. Um, fascinating. Uh, and this question is from Anne and she's asking, does the repetition of his motifs, motifs also allow him to experiment with color and light and shape? And is experimentation as a modern practice divorced from narrative just as much a motivation as expressions of temporality. Yeah, um, that's a, a lovely question. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, it had two parts, didn't it? Though um, the second is is how much is he doing? Kind of is is he interested in in more abstract experimentation in itself? Yes, I think so. But I think it's also interesting how they can't entirely be disentangled. Um, how he's using um, he's he's using these experimentation this these forms of experimentation with color and light and shape and that he takes partly from impressionism and partly from cubism and partly from the nabi um, to to do things with temporality and vision so they um, they they yeah they're very interlinked um, but I think there is some. Absolutely, there are some purely uh, there. There are some pure experiments with light and color, particularly. Um, in fact, the painting that's on the screen now. There's this kind of ultravioletness. It's like he's trying to go to the. And again, this comes back to beyond vision. When his, for me, when his colors become most riotous and most unbelievable is when they are quite unbelievable. They seem to almost go beyond the spectrum of human vision. So this painting. Um, that we're looking at here, um, there's this kind of color of violet that is almost ultraviolet. It's almost off the scale of the colors that human vision will actually look at. And there's a painting in the Phillips collection in Washington called The Palm. And somehow he gets that strange, almost neon feeling color that kind of feels just totally unreal. Um, and uh, I think he's interested in when vision becomes so, uh, sorry, what we're actually seeing becomes almost unreal. Um, and when, and yeah, vision that almost seems to go beyond the normal scope of human habitual seeing. Like, um, and, and again, that's another way in which experiments with color are tied up with, I think, um, with questions around around the possibilities and conditions of of knowledge of vision yeah um i don't you know, we're very lucky to have your ear and um knowledge at, at our at our um here with us i don't want to take up all of your time though i know it's, it's, it's no like... i don't want to take up everyone else's but <laughs> i mean i could talk about one well, time. <laughs> maybe a, a few more questions then and um i we we um, um, we actually we're not seeing that painting. If you, I don't know if you wanted to share screen again. Um, oh, or, sorry. All right, I thought it would be in the corner um, for some reason, but um, I can do that. Up, up yeah. to you. Uh, the um, but this might be a good follow up to how you were speaking about um, color saturation and 
different uses. Um, Phyllis Tuckman is asking, have you studied how Bonnard determined the dimensions of his canvases when large, when not so grand? Mm, when, when they're large and when they're, and when they're not? Um, I, I believe so, yeah. Yeah, um, well, it's it seems that he painted, he didn't determine the, in fact, this is, <laughs> thank you for asking that because um, it's kind of another um, point in my argument, I guess, um, because uh, he didn't have an image and decide what he was going to paint and then get the canvas cut accordingly. He, he pinned canvas to the wall with thumbtacks and he didn't decide where he was going to stop until after he'd drawn out what it all painted. Uh, and then he would cut the canvas after the fact. So um, again, that speaks to not having an image in the mind um, before starting out, but um, to letting the image unfold and then, and then cutting it. Um, that said, that's what, um, that's what is often said about Bonnard. And I mean, the thumbtacks part is certainly true. And there is an image, there is a painting which is unfinished, which you can, see, which hasn't been cut down, which I've seen, you know, um, it's called Cherry something. Anyway, um, which it very much he has started in the middle and then it just kind of peters out and there's loads of white around it. So I no, I've no doubt this is true, but it's also interesting that the Tate um, at their recent show in 2019, um, took his canvases out of their frames so you could see the edges. Um, and I think we were all expect, I, I know I was expecting, I thought, wow, wonderful idea. And I was kind of expecting to see more on the edges when they took them out of the frames. Um, there wasn't really, they actually did come to a reasonably neat line. Um, but nonetheless, it, they're often a hand-drawn line. Um, it's often a hand-drawn line that I think he just kind of draws in once he's got to the, what he's gonna call an edge. Um, yes. Um, this question is from Kristen and they're asking, um, uh, she says, thank you. Um, and are you aware of any relationship Bernard may have had with Goethe's color theory or a Goethean philosophical perspective of a phenomenological, sorry, unfixed observation of nature um, and that the sense of unreal colors could be connected with Goethe's work mm. or with after images. Sorry. Mm. Um, that's not something I know of. That's not something I've come across. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the probably Goethe's color theory would have been, gosh, my, you know, my, er, like my expertise does not cover all of, um, you know, what was learned in kind of third Republic art school, but um, quite possibly Goethe was, I would imagine that Goethe's color theory is probably taught, I mean, at the time it was more like Charles Leblanc um, and uh, Le Coq de Bois, Boudrin and others. And, but, so I haven't come across Goethe as like the dominant, as the dominant name um, that was taught in, that would have been taught in art schools. Um, but I kind of imagine that it would have been mentioned. Um, and I mean, he was formally trained um but i haven't come across it explicitly but that's a very interesting idea um in terms of un unreal colors uh yeah so thank you um and this is uh from Ramy. um they say fantastic talk thank you i'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the idea of shimmer or light in relationship to both the drawings in terms of line quality and the studio objects that show up in some photographs of Bernard's studio, like uh, mm -hmm. oil-like papers on the walls. Um, yeah, so um, for anyone who um, needs that question unpacking, who's listening, um, yes, yeah, so Bernard, after his death, photographs of his studio were taken and, and actually possibly uh, during his and during his life, um, and you can, but in in the late, in in the later years of his life, and you can see that he's tacked up to the wall, um, sweet wrappers that had been at one point crumpled, and they're just crumply shiny bits of paper, and he actually sticks them up onto his wall um, next to various postcards of works, um, of artworks, um, and he called them his sparkles. These pieces of paper. Um, 
to a, to a journalist, he said, yes, these are my sparkles. Uh, and it, But that's an interesting question to ask me to relate those sparkles, if you like, to his drawings specifically, because in, in his paintings, that kind of shimmer is, is clear um, and often occurs, the shimmer is so clever. Um, I think it often occurs because two competing colors are next to one another and they're kind of slightly, um, their edges are slightly unclear. And so they almost literally compete for your attention, for your eye's attention. And so it's almost like a shimmering effect occurs, I think, um, which, but, but in his drawings, you know, I think actually his drawings don't pay it very much attention to shimmer because they're very concerned with, um, with this kind of lines that unfold. They're much more line based. And when they do fill in the areas between those lines, it's often with more like textures just of drawing that, notif that almost feel like notation, as I said. That is actually interesting. I, I could be wrong, but I don't think he actually really tries to capture shimmer in his drawings, only in his paintings. I'd have to think about more about why that would be and, and so on, but thank you for the question. Maybe, maybe it's just very hard to capture drawing, uh, shimmer in the kind of drawing that he makes. I think. Especially with how you describe he's using almost like a nub. Um, yeah. yeah. Different kind of idea. Um, yeah. So, um, Lucy, this has been a, a fascinating talk, but maybe this it's a good time to, to conclude. Um, the question is great, thank you. I would just like to mention um, for Lucy's sake that you can um, order the book and it's, because I've done so and it's coming <laughs> and then it will come out in May, but it's really fascinating and your your scholarship is, is uh, there's something, it feels like something um, new to the conversation. So, um, thank you very much for joining us, um, and um, and yeah, I hope we uh, have a chance to do some more um, discussion. Um, uh, a, a good question from someone just now: um, Where do we actually order the book? And I, I, think the... it, I think you can do it from the Yale University. Yes, website. you can. You can. Then I'm. Um... You know, I, I don't know how it works that I may get an offer code at some point. And if I do, I'll, I'll probably, if I'm allowed to, I'll probably tweet it. Um, uh, you know, sometimes there's these kind of percentages off, but I don't know yet. Uh, if I do, I'll tweet it. I'm at Lucy Whelan, I think, on Twitter, I think. Um, uh, but um, I, I think probably the Yale University website, but uh, University Press website, but probably also various other bookshops. Yeah. Not owned by... That, that pay taxes as well, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> Sorry, well, Mary. <laughs> there's a lot of comments coming in just saying thank you so much and this has been wonderful and I couldn't agree more. So um, thank you again. And um, yeah, well- um, Thank you so much for inviting yeah. me and for everyone to, um, to everyone who came and spent that evening listening to me talking about Bon. I'm really grateful. Um, he's well loved here. So. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, have a wonderful night and we'll see you soon.